Hello, everyone. I want to check, do you hear me well when I speak without the microphone here? Is it okay? Yeah? So, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. I have been at uh, PyCon France a few times, and it's a great honor for me to be here today and to give this uh, opening keynote. So, I want to talk about my experience both as a scientist and an open source developer and what these two worlds bring to each other. So, let me start first uh, by introducing myself and explain just a little bit why I use Python in my work. So, I consider myself to be both a mathematician and a computer scientist. In a nutshell, I could say that I use a computer scientist's mind to solve mathematical problems. So I approach uh, mathematics with an algorithmic point of view and with code. Uh, to be more specific, my topic is called uh, combinatorics. And to give you an idea that what it looks like, the, these are actual uh, research notes from a few years ago. And to give you another idea that also what it looks like, so this is Python code that I use in my day-to-day -day research. So I won't go into uh, details, but the basic idea is that my research relies on code. So anytime I write a research paper, a mathematic paper, there is a program that's behind it somehow. There, there has been some experiment, there has been some code, I'm experimenting on mathematical objects to find new results. If you want to know more about that, I actually gave a whole talk where I explained that. It's called uh, Experimental Pure Mathematics Using Sage. Today is not the topic of the conference because I want to give you a more a broader uh, view of the links that I see between open source and science. So. I should start by saying that I am not the only scientist who uh, codes. There's been a, a survey in 2014 among UK academics, and there's been shown that 92% of those academics use research software. And from the person who did the survey, he was saying himself, well, maybe the 8% that we made, they just didn't understand the question. So, or basically what we see here that many people who do research, most people who do research actually use software. 69% say that their research would not be practical without research software. This is definitely my case. I don't see how I can do mathematics if I don't have a computer. And 56% say they develop their own software. So this is also my case. I'm in all those three cases. So this gives you an idea of how how important uh, writing code and code is important for research. So this is like a, the survey is cross field. So what about mathematics? I don't have any specific numbers for mathematician. I can just rely on my own experience. From what I see around me, most of my colleagues use computers at some level to do their, to do their research. And somehow we can see that because there are many, many software for mathematicians. So I went on Wikipedia and I, find, I found 39 computer algebra system listed. So I put the main ones here in this picture. And you have to understand that even though research happens inside research papers, inside, inside theorems, it also happens within the software and with the code that mathematician, mathematicians write for the software. Not all of this software are open source. So here are three examples. Uh, Maple, Ma Mathematica, and Magma, so three very widely used software which are not open source. And if you look at it, some of them are run by private companies and they actually charge universities quite a lot of money to use them. So I've showed you just a, a bunch of the prices that they offer. So this could be a first motivation you say, okay, I'm going to go open source because I don't want to pay that. 
this is not my main motivation. The reason I, I went to open source, the reason I'm choosing open source is because to follow my, to, to, to be what I want to be as a scientist, to follow my values as a scientist, I need to go open source. This is where I find something that matches what I want to be as a scientist. So this shared values between science and open source, this is what I'm going to describe now. So as a scientist, the first thing is I want to contribute. So in a model where I just pay some money and then I'm given a software, but I don't have, I cannot even look what's in this software and I don't have a say about what's in this software. I cannot be a part of it. This is not a model that I, I like. I don't want to be a simple user. I want to be a contributor. As a scientist, I want to create knowledge and share it. When I create new knowledge, any new knowledge I create, I want it to be available to everybody. So I don't work only for me or for other academics. I work for the public. I am paid by the public through public money to do what I do. I find that I'm very privileged to be paid to do something that I really love, to follow my passion about mathematics. And I find that I, it's my duty to give something back. And in that sense, I find that everything that I do should be made, uh, everything that I do through my work should be made public to everyone. So this means that, for example, all my papers are accessible online. So they are not open source. And the reason they are not open source is because the uh, current uh, editorial system in academia doesn't let me to do that. So I won't start about this topic now because this is something that actually makes me really angry and I could talk about it for a very long time and I'm sure any other academics here understand what I mean. But let's say that I'm just doing my best so that everything that I write, the mathematical content that I write, uh, is accessible to everyone. So. All my teaching material is open source. This is something that I've been doing for the last years, that every time I was creating new teaching material, so a new class, new exercises, anything, I would actually put everything on GitHub, uh, so the source and the final files, and with an open source license. So, that, so it means that not only the students can have access to it, but any other uh, teachers and they know that they have the right to reuse it and that can even contribute back to me uh, uh, telling me what what I can improve in my in my class and it also means that all the code I write is open source so most of it goes into uh, this software that I, uh, that is called SageMat and which is a uh, open source mathematical software. So some of it will go as actual contribution to the software like it enters the source code. Some of it would be like external packages that people can install. And most of it is actually just research code. But I've taken the habit now to put this, even this code that is uh, not finished, not documented, just kind of uh, my own research code, to put it also online with an open source license so that everyone, every other researcher who reads my paper can just go and look at the, at the code that I read. As a scientist, I collaborate. I go to conferences. I have international collaborators. I organize workshops. I organize seminars. When I write a paper, this paper is proofread, is reviewed by other scientists. So it's really not something that you do on your own. Science is something that you do as a group. So the inherent collaborative aspect of open source is very natural for scientists. For me, it makes complete sense to work with others. Actually, I, actu I use the same tools. I use Git both for my scientific papers and for my code. And more, like on the more philosophical point of view, the idea that we are joining forces to create something better is uh, a motivation for both. As a scientist, I want my results to be reused and improved. Let's say I prove a new theorem. So I publish a paper with this theorem and the proof. It now becomes uh, public knowledge. So a new mathematician can come 
and use this result to prove a new th another theorem. They can also, if they want, they can rewrite my theorem maybe in a better way. They can find another proof. They can even fix a mistake maybe that I left in the original paper. So science is not something that is fixed once and for all. It evolves and improves over time. And I should say, <laughs> just like open source code. So the, once again, the idea that when I write something, it's going to join a bigger frame where it's going to have its own life and it's going to be improved and reused by future developers and mathematicians. This is something that I want. And what I like about this is that I can be there in the next phase of this life, of my program or my paper, but I don't have to. It's going to happen whether I'm there or not. I'm just living it for the future. So for all these reasons, as a scientist, I need to write open source code. Really, after all I said, I came to the conclusion that it is not possible for me to go back to writing something that would not be open source. I, it, sh it would just not be uh, in line with my ethic as a scientist. And what I think is that this process, this mind process that I had is something that all the scientists have had in the past and many other reached the same conclusion. And I, th I think it's not a coincidence that when you look at the story of open source, it's some of it emerged from academia. And I'm thinking of two specific persons here. I'm giving two examples. So Richard Stallman, who was the creator of GNU, he was working at MIT. And uh, the second example is someone very well known to computer scientists and mathematicians, is Donald Knut. And in particular, he is the creator of the language tech that is widely used uh, in mathematics. So now let's look at math and open, s and open source. So basically, as long as there's been the concept of open source software, we've had open source mathematical software. And now, in the last decades or so, it developed a lot, and we have what we would call like a whole ecosystem of software that are open source for mathematicians. So we have a bunch of specialized libraries. I've put a few names here. <laughs> The goal, a specialized library is really a software that is often developed by a small group of people and whose main target is a subfield of mathematics. So it's, for example, GAP is for group computation, group theory. Well, we also have general purpose systems like SageMath, which is the one that I know the most and the one I'm going to talk a bit more about later on. And we also use things that are meant for a wider uh, group, so interactive computing env uh, environments such as the iPad and Jupyter and uh, the CoolCalc platform. And we see ourselves uh, just a little bit in a big community of, uh, for example, the scientific Python and the sci generally open source science uh, and software in general. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the SageMath software. So the official name is SageMath, but I'm often going to say only Sage. It was started in 2005 by a mathematician called William Stein. The story is uh, quite interesting. He was actually writing a lot of code before, and he was writing, he's a number theorist, and he was writing the code in a software called Magma. And Magma was one of the examples that I gave earlier. It's not open source. And at some point, I think he reached the same uh, conclusion that I had before. He had this frustration that he was writing code for a proprietary software, and he, he had no say on the software itself, and everyone who wanted to use this code had to uh, get the Magma license, and he felt really, he felt that this was going nowhere, that he was losing his time doing that. And that's why he decided to create Sage, which was a big step, because he had to make it from, well, not from nothing, actually, because there were already many other, uh, those libraries, specialized libraries, already existed. So the first thing <laughs> that he did was that he took all, everything that existed that was open source and he glued them with Python. So he created the Python interface that 
allowed uh, newcomers to just take whatever they needed in the different libraries and work with it. And by the way, this was one of the first use of the, uh, at the time, IPython uh, terminal was uh, when, we, when Sage was created. And he managed to create something that was good enough that all the people started to join. And it grew out of this many libraries glued together with Python. It grew it, its own libraries on, in Python and also in the uh, Cyton on top of it, and it grew a whole vibrant community. So currently there are uh, 271 contributors listed on the Sage website on the, on, on the map all over the world. And what about me? I, so I, st I joined uh, I started re doing research in 2010 and I was doing uh, combinatorics. And it turned out that my people, my group, uh, combinatorics, they just had decided to move to Sage. So when I say move to Sage, what I mean is that they used to also write code together. There was already this culture of sharing code among uh, people in combinatorics. But they didn't have an open source solution. So they were, they were especially they were using a software called Moopad that is now mostly disappeared. And they had the same problem that William Stein had, that they were writing code for a software on which they had no control and which was not open source. So they took this decision to move to Sage. So they basically translated a bunch of code into Sage. And when I arrived, this was already done. And so I'm... Uh, Sage native in the sense that I started doing research while Sage was already good enough that I could use it. And it's the only research software that I've used to do my research. And I'm really happy about it. Okay, so I've told you about the love story that is between open source and science. And now I want to share a bit what are the challenges that we face. And I think they are very similar in both worlds. So the main problem we have with open source and science is we need funding, recognition, and sustainability. And I'm saying that for open source project in science, but I'm pretty sure this is a problem that any open source project would have. So the first question is, who pays for the project? So I said earlier, OK, when you have a proprietary software, you have to pay this license. When you go to open source, most of the time, it's free. Well, it's not free, because there are people working on the software. So who pays them if you don't pay the license? And that's an actual problem. Because most of, in, in, in science, most of this is actually done by researchers who take this from their research time. And and the question is, how is the development work valued in the community? How is this time that you put to software valued in your research career? And this leads to, how is your so software going to survive? Because if you don't pay for software, and if you don't value the work, then the work is not going to get down, and the software will die, whether it's open source or not. So let's look back at the SageMath development model. So the main idea is for users by users. So we are encouraged as write to write code only when it's used for our own research. OK, so that's good. But that means we need better academic recognition for research software development. Because at the moment, it's not uh, if you write a whole package about optimization of uh, factorization of polynomials, it's not going to be as good in your CV as if you had done a few uh, papers on the subject. So we need to value this work from researchers when they try to put their work into software. And it's not the only problem, because it's good to write research code. But what about the rest of the code? Who does the dirty work? And when I say dirty work, this is what I mean. Packaging, interfaces, install scripts, low-level software interaction. These are tasks that, are, that have low research value and high technical value. So basically, if you don't get recognition for writing research code, you really get absolutely no recognition as a software developer, as a research 
as a researcher when you write this, because this is not research. And the truth is that it's not really your job to do it. So I put this number here. So we said that 56% of academics develop their own software, but only 21% of these 56 received a proper training in software development. So basically, it's not our job to do this technical task, and we're not really good at it. So if I look at myself, I have been trained in software development, but I. I'm not the best person to do that because I don't want to do that because my main thing is research and I don't want to take my research time to, to do this code and I'm not the most qualified to do it. So we need other people and these other people they are called research software engineers and we really need those people with us. So it means engineers who have a true interest for research and want to work in open source and in academia. But to get these people, these people exist, but we need also to be able to offer them jobs, which means recurrent fundings, proper career, career prospects, and some flexibility of a time and mission so that when someone works, when we recruit an engineer, he, can, he or she can work on whatever project that we need at the moment, and this can evolve over time. So this is something that we are working on very hard. We're trying hard to convince our institutions, our government, that open source user-driven de development is the good way to go and that it needs sustainable funding to function. Sometimes we're making progress. So in 2015, we launched this project called Open Dream Kit, which stands for Open Digital Research Environment Toolkit for the Advent advancement of mathematics. So basically, it's a project that supports open source in mathematics for many different software. So this was uh, from a European call, from a Euro Horizon 2020 European Research Infrastructure Work Program. So it's really good that we managed to get this because it, mean, it mean that we convinced Europe that what we were doing was good and that it was worth uh, giving money to. So we received a budget of 7.6 million and it was run by uh, 18 partner institutions in seven countries. And this money was used to pay research engineers uh, for SAGE and also for Jupyter and for other software and also to pay our own time as researchers when we were working on the project and also to pay for conferences and workshops. It started in 2015, it ends in 2019. What's next? That's a question where I don't have an answer. So one thing I could do is I could apply for a new project, but then it would, uh, it, I don't want to spend my whole time applying for projects and managing European projects. So there is something here that we have to, this where we have to make the most progress is, is we have to convince this institution that it's not something that we do for four year project and then another four year project. It's something where we need sustainability and we need to be able to offer a permanent jobs to those research engineers. So that was the first, uh, the first thing. I want to talk about another thing, another challenge, which is more from within our own communities. We need inclusivity and diversity. And this is something that we have to work within ourselves. We need to develop software for everyone, with everyone. I think the sentence should mean something for any open source developer. This is the reason why we chose open source, is it not? Like, to work with everyone, for everyone. And at the moment, I think putting your code on GitHub with an open source license is not enough. So let me give you some numbers that are interesting. 88% of Windows users and 93% of Linux users use research software. So not such a big difference there. When we come to development, 41% of Windows users and 90% of, of Linux users develop software. So here you see that there is a difference. And in Sage, I can say that most of the people who develop that I see are either on Linux or Mac. And this goes to, this is where we see something like the native Windows SageMat install being done only in 2017, even though we have so many users who are on Windows. 
And by the way, this was thanks to our engineers recruited by Open Dream Kit. But it's very late that we had it. And this is bad because you have to remember that even though open source is free to use, there is this technical barrier very often that stops people from using it. And the reason people run into this barrier, are, um, 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 there are many reasons. <coughs> For example, I've been teaching Sage in many places such as uh, I've been to Uganda and Colombia and over there I met some students and most of them were on Windows and none of them had heard of open source. So, th and this is for this student that I want to develop Sage. These are the students who need it the most because their institutions cannot pay for the licenses. And these students are the ones that are still deprived from it because we don't care about them any e enough. Another number, even though 56% researchers develop their own software, this hides a big gap, a big gender gap. 70% of ma male researchers develop it, whereas only 30% women do. And 92% of them use it. So it's good, women use research software, but they don't develop it. So it, from what I hear when I see that is that many researchers, many women, still rely on some other people to do something <laughs> that is very important for their work. And it makes me sad, but it's something that I want to fix. And it means that this barrier that stops women to go into science, it also exists at a very high level. It exists at the level of women who have PhD in mathematics and tell me, I'm not good with code. This breaks my heart. Any woman who has a PhD in mathematics should be good with code. She can be good with code. So the question of why we have this, I'd say there are many reasons. It's rooted inside society lack of training, lack of confidence. What can we do about it? We, it's difficult to solve the whole society, but we can try a little bit. So we have to support women colors and women initiative. I've been running uh, with Anna Livia Gomar, the Pi Lady uh, chapter in Paris. I've been organizing meeting for women in SAGE and this works, so please support us. And I, I need to finish now, so I'm going to finish with this <laughs> a list of questions. It's to go beyond this just being a woman or a man, you have to, we have to check our privileges. How did you get where you are? When did you have your first computer? When did you write your first line of code? What field did you study? When did you first hear about open source? What country are you from? Did your parents go to university? What is the color of your skin? Are you straight, non-disabled, cisgendered? And we could, have, we could add more questions. The idea be behind this question is to make you realize that there are things, most, most of you here, you have been helped by some power imbalance in society that helped you get where you are. And you had your own struggle but you also had helped, and you have to remember that there are other people who maybe were not as advantaged as you were when they were going through uh, their, their past. So I'm going to finish with that. Remember, we want software for everybody, by everybody. And this, one, this means you want people in who are not like you. And I'm finishing with that. Thank you. <laughs>